Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's tutorial is based on the Mazurka in A flat major, Opus 59, number two, by Frederic Chopin. This beautiful Mazurka is the second in a set of three mazurkas in Opus 59. Chopin wrote and published these mazurkas in 1845. He wrote many mazurkas during his lifetime, uh, at least 69 of them. And this is the shortest of the set. Before we dive into the tutorial portion of today's video, I thought I would go ahead and share a performance of this piece that I gave at the 2015 National Chopin Competition. Here we go. you enjoyed that performance or, as I said in the last tutorial, found things that you didn't like that you would like to do differently. A lot of times being musician, being a musician is difficult because we hear so many different interpretations of the same piece and we wonder, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to shape this line? How am I going to voice this? Uh, how much time should I be taking? Uh, or how much rubato should I be employing, that pushing and pulling of time, especially in these mazurkas. All of those things are considerations that I hope this tutorial can help clear up for you, help you either be convinced of the ideas I present or be polarized by those ideas to choose a different idea that you are convinced of. That's the beauty of music. Before we dive into the tutorial section of the piece, I thought I would go and... Well, I guess this is part of the tutorial. Before we dive into the mechanics, the technique, the interpretation, the voicing, um, the shape, the pedaling, I thought I would just give a quick overview of the form of the piece. I always like to do that to help keep myself organized. It also helps with memorizing. So we see the A section start in A flat major. So Allegretto, definitely faster than the first mazurka, but certainly not as intense as uh, the next one, the third one coming up, which we will do a tutorial on in the coming weeks or months. The B, the, oh, excuse me, the A section repeats at bar 23. 
all he's doing is he's expanding these single notes to sixths and various intervals. Okay, so we will be going over a lot of different techniques in there, how to play quick parallel or uh, consecutive intervals. A lot of students struggle playing quick sixths, sixths or fifths or fourths or thirds in a row. I'll be going over a lot of methods that I've used with in my own practice and with my own students that have helped them to loosen up and play with more ease. We'll be going over techniques on developing accuracy, not having to look at every single note and be worried about accuracy. Um, moving on with the form, we see the B section come at bar 45. And then we see the return of the A section in bar 69. Now on the left hand, then we see this chromatic sequence of events. And I slaved over that fingering for quite a while. I had like four different versions written in here. And I thought, which one am I going to present for the tutorial? I actually came up with a few new things. If I was to learn this again or to teach it, uh, sorry, if I was to learn this fresh, if I'd never learned it, this is the fingering I would go over. So we'll be going over that. That brings us to a coda. So, so far we have A in bar 1, return of A in, uh, repeat of A in bar 23, the B section in bar 45, the A section returning, so ternary form, ABA, uh, coming back in 69, and then we see a coda in bar uh, 89. beautiful, reminiscent, nostalgic. And at the end, I do a, a little something different these days. I like it to evaporate. I might have just been nervous at the competition. That was a very high pressure competition. I kind of ended big and then got softer. That is one way to think of it, but I think I like it better like that now. So the piece ends very quickly and unexpectedly to end this coda. It's just two little heartbeats. Boom, 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 boom. Before going into that very intense third mazurka. So I hope that gives you a quick layout of the piece. Let's dive in with some mechanics to start with today. I want to go over some things that have helped me in my life, my pianistic life, to play more accurately with jumps, with quick moving passages. Uh, some of the more intense things that I've played, and I have videos on these on YouTube and in Pro Practice Piano Academy on Scarbo. There's a lot of jumping around in that. The Grand Polonaise by Chopin, that beginning is so difficult. And same... is such difficult material. Um, even the Mendelssohn Serious Variations that we'll be covering later this year in a series of tutorials. I'm actually working on that right now to prep for those tutorials. All of those challenged me a lot. So while this mazurka I don't think is technically like a monster by any means, this is still a challenge. Be able to play this confidently, especially if you don't want to be saddled to looking at that the entire time. If you want to mostly be watching the right hand, perhaps you can look at some things in the left hand. I don't have a problem with you looking at the left hand, I just don't want you to fail if you aren't looking at it the entire time. And some of these exercises should help. So the first thing that I would say is this exercise I made up for a student 
Um, and my teachers had alluded to this a bit, but I made it up for him when he was playing Scarbo. <laughs> just horrible. Sorry, I have not played that in over a year. Um, <laughs> so about 10 months ago, I performed it, I think. So about a year going cold. Uh, I've just warmed up with this mazurka. So how do we get that? With any sort of confidence, yes, the pedal can help hide any mistakes. You don't have that luxury here in the mazurka. But something I made up for him when he was struggling with this was something I call the chord combo exercise. Very simple plan. You play just the principal note to the bottom notes and perhaps just end to the downbeat of the next measure. Then the principal note to the middle note ending to the next measure. And then just the top. Okay, so we've done all combos of single notes. Now let's do all combos of two notes. Octaves. Okay, now we're ready for the full chord. And you're going to notice when you go to the full chord, it actually feels easier a lot of times than just doing those different combinations. Because actually doing single notes, you think that would be the easiest one. Actually, in many ways, it's the hardest because you don't have the security of the full chord. This feels good in the hand. It feels secure. We know the distances. To jump to a single note is difficult. One step further with this exercise is you can do this in a tempo that is unrealistic, so faster than you're going to need. And then the full chord. And you're gonna notice that you develop a lot of confidence using that exercise. So the first thing I wanted to go over was the chord combo exercise to help with that left hand. The next thing I would recommend is eyes closed work. One thing that really helps with eyes closed work is to think of the piano as this topographical map. The map is very predictable because we have three high black keys, two high black keys, three high black keys, two. And so we have these series of three and two black keys. When students are really struggling with sight reading, I will make them only look at the music and they say, well, what if I lose my place? What if I, my bench position changes? I say, then you align yourself. You find, oh, there's three black keys, so I know that this is E and B. Or three black keys, I know A is between the top two. This is also a way to help you orient yourself and to play more accurately. So I'm not processing like, I'm going over A flat, B flat, D flat. I'm not going that <laughs> crazy in my mind, but I can, I can kind of drag my fingers along these black keys and get a good idea of where I'm at. And I'm not saying you drag your fingers across the piano all the time and make all this noise, but just for this exercise, when you're doing eyes closed, this can be a help. Leaving the keyboard and jumping up and coming over is inefficient, um, and it also is disorienting. So. It's like, wait, where am I? Uh, there I am. Whereas if you stay close to the keyboard, you have more of a chance of hitting those notes. Okay, the next thing I thought I would mention is just some fingering. When I have big chords like this, I don't wanna get too cute with this even though I have giant hands to be like three, two, one, three, two, one. I'm gonna keep that pretty simple with a five, three, one. 5-3-1, 5-2-1. This one, I will go to a 4-2-1 because that feels really good. You could do a 5-2-1 if you want as well. You could do a 3-2-1. That's just a little bit more of this kind of waving rotation. So 5, 3-2-1, 5-2-1, 4-2-1, 4-2-1, 3-1, 3-2-1. That's one place that I might do a more stretch up fingering. You're welcome to do 5-1, Oh, sorry, 4-1, 4-2-1, or whatever else you want. You're welcome to do whatever you want. You don't have to do what I'm saying. This is just hopefully helping you. Um, the next thing that I would say is something that I really employed a lot when I played the first Chopin Ballade. The coda in that is really intense. You can, I have many different, uh, I have a full pro practice tutorial on it, and then other things going over the coda. 
One thing that I found very helpful is quick two note jumps. So just getting used to that. You can look at it, you can do it eyes closed. Eyes closed is obviously harder. And do the opposite way as well into the next measure. And then. Now if, you're, if you come across, so you're going along. Oh, this is going so good. But then I miss that one. Let's say I miss that. I'll just hang out and do that until I can nail it like four or five times in a row. Until that feels really confident. If you're new to this, you might just hold on to one successful jump for a while. You don't have to nail it four or five times in a row. But that's a very helpful exercise. And over time, you'll be able to nail it four or five times in a row. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about execution because this mazurka can be very ugly. If you play it vertically like that, one thing that really helps me, I learned this from the D, I'm, I'm referencing a lot of outside examples, I hope you don't mind, um, from the D-flat Nocturne uh, by Chopin, the Opus 27 number two. That was always a scary opening for me because I didn't want to bang that and I also didn't want to do that or get a ghost note and not play it. So what I did is I would kind of reach in, my second, third, and fourth fingers almost touching the fall board here. This is the fall board on your piano. Um, and I would pull back and then I would go up into the keys a little bit. My thumb's a little short. Everyone's thumb is shorter, I, so that's why I'm going up so I can then stroke back on that one as well. It all happens very quickly, and it's very tiny. You, you probably wouldn't register that as like a big pullback motion watching me, but it feels like that. And so same thing to get this very velvety sound on the mazurka. All right, I think we're about ready to go into some art artistry now. So 